great for your idealism when you go to see him because um, you realise that it's uh, it's all about the music and um, and and still and still loving what you do and um, in front of an audience of who cares. I was in the car coming back from a gig and. Uh... I was with Lon, and, uh, and the moon was the biggest thing I'd ever seen, you know. And it was, and it was, it was red. I mean, brilliant red. As I mean, Lon was explaining that uh, the uh, in mythology the, or uh, in olden times, the uh, lovers would go out in that moon, and it would, you know, it, it could you could wish for anything you like. That's how they call it, a crimson moon. These are the the, uh, the guitar tracks here. And it's recorded straight into the. It's recorded straight into the, the computer, so there's no no tape involved. You know, this is on my head. You know, so when it's together enough, and I'm at the point of recording, I, I usually set up a, a, a pattern of some kind that. Uh, on the computer that I can uh, play to. I'm going to start with the guitar, really. Uh, I mean, just sitting over there playing. I'd actually be working to a metronome, which about, uh, I don't know if, if I should turn it on or not. I mean, <laughs> they're quite horrible metronomes. I can't remember which, which went down first. Uh, probably just the bass drum. Uh, and, then, and then play the guitar to that. The early 60s is a time when uh, we kind of accepted ideas of uh, how you should live and what your ambitions should be and everything uh, were all up for grabs. It was such a free time that the authority for those, those 10 to 20 years after the Second World War hadn't really come down on people in the way that they have now. We were all uh, travelling without maps in the dark. One thing people say about Bert when he hit London was that he was fully formed. His impact was extraordinary. Uh, I think because he wrote songs. He seemed to know exactly what he was doing. The way he played a guitar I'd never heard before. I'd never heard that. He was just miles ahead of everybody else. Bert was a focal point. Um, for uh, the acoustic youth of the mid-60s. Here he is playing in folk clubs in front of mostly a folk audience and he's bringing in all this stuff that they may not even have heard of, you know, but he's heard of it and he's not only heard of it, but he's absorbed it and turned it into his own thing. How did this guy get to be able to do this when nobody else was doing it? Well, there was one record, like Mingus, uh, um, right, and uh, a few other things that, that Bert used to listen to a lot and he would try to get bits and pieces of the way that say that sort of uh, particular kind of American uh, uh, 50s jazz uh, was constructed and he would try to adapt. Up until that time most people were trying to play a bit of blues and finger picking and Bert had gone way into another stage he was inventing new, just inventing new music. I don't know that it came out particularly in the lyrics he wrote, but it was absolutely implicit in the music that he played, you know, because he just ignored boundaries. He was seminal. It wasn't just the playing, I think it was just the... It was, it was the, the perceived depth. It was, a, it was like looking into a, a, um, a human being who was vulnerable. The, the folk music of the early 60s was uh, quite a dangerous, dark, radical, left field sort of situation populated by really charismatic, intriguing characters like uh, Ewan McCall, Davy Graham, Alex Campbell, John Rinborn, Alexis Corner, Roy Harper. Young people who were at the cutting edge of acoustic music. Scott Seuss in Cambridge Circus and uh, Les Cousins in uh, Greek Street. Those were the two centres uh, of, of this kind of bohemian, swinging London, late night, uh, Soho based happening scene. Everybody wanted to play the cousins. You know. They're 
come from all over Europe with their sleeping bags to sleep in. And Bert was absolutely at the epicenter of that. He he was the man. I had a residency there. I think it was on Wednesday. I had a spot suit on a Tuesday. For about two years. If you didn't know about Bert, you weren't anywhere. It was like going to Glastonbury and buy a ticket for the weekend. People like uh, John McLaughlin and Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and so on all dropped into Les Cousins, you know, at three in the morning after their gig at the Marquee or whatever to, to, to jam. It was the most glamorous scene in, in London, in a way, I always thought. People like, like Jimmy Page, who was a session man at the time, Paul Simon, who was uh, a singer-songwriter. All these people and, and you know, many, many more would see Bert Janch in concert in, in you know, it's at one in the morning in some smoky little cellar in Soho and, and be inspired. Entangle formed in early 67. Bert had been on the London scene for about three years. And playing music which we like, which derive from all sources, jazz, definitely very rhythmic music. We were just one of those groups that uh, you, if you were into it, you really weren't it. I saw this band who was supposedly like a folk band, and they actually just looked really heavy. And um, they looked like they knew they were kind of bad. And really, their career was exponential between 1967 and 1972. They were everywhere at that time. They were on all the TV magazine shows. They toured America four times, played the Carnegie Hall. They were all over Europe, the Albert Hall, any number of times. The 1970 Isle of Wight Festival, um, really the biggest concert stages of the day. The pressure of touring for so many years at such a, at such a level uh, it didn't go down well with, with his character in the long run. I actually do actually like being on the road, but then again it kills me. <laughs> you know, I get really tired of uh, having to stick to a, even to a uh, gig list. And that band was famous, but you couldn't change anything. It was really the start of a drink problem and a, and a, a dislike of, of, of fame. How we managed to do, do the shows, I, some of the songs were really complex, you know, really. With uh, glockenspiels and, you know, four part harmonies, and sometimes, you know, we'd leave Jackie on the stage all by herself and go and have a drink. After the Pentangle split at the end of 1972, uh, largely at Bert's instigation, uh, it has to be said, he went into a period of semi-retirement. The music club scene had moved on, um, and the commercial music world had moved on from the Pentangle too. So really for his last couple of years, the band had been a little bit of an anachronism after the, the, the really excellent LA Turnaround album. Bert made something of a, uh, of a comeback. If ever there was a guitar hero picture, on the cover of that album, there you've got one. Uh, but he's playing acoustic music, and he looks like he's, you know, like he's, he's he lives his music and he's, he's lives an interesting life. I think it's fair to say that the Bert Jansch revival, in terms of publicity and, and general awareness and, and critical favour, uh, certainly began in 1995. When the circus comes to town, was um, knocked me out. I was really pleased that he'd made a record that I really liked. It was a record that justified all the shouting. There's a style of guitar playing in uh, contemporary music today which uh, people in the know can pretty much say that's, that's a Bert Jansch style of guitar playing. What attracted me most, I mean technically about his playing, is that he played in different parts. He had a really nice rhythmic feel and the bass patterns often were just played in the thumb. It doesn't suit tempo or time changes or, or tuning. You get somebody who plays something possibly simple Perhaps not so simple, but it sounds simple and it has this wonderful, you know, woven sort of texture and, and, and you come away thinking, well, I'm going to like to play that, and that goes round and round your head. It is made up of uh, Woody Guthrie and, and all the component parts are there, you know, it's not a... Uh, and a little bit of blues playing, you know, it's, you know, from various people. You know. It's all there if you look for it, but... Uh, it sort of gels into one. Bert's playing is, is so rhythmic and, 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 and of its own world. I owe so much to Davey for the, you know, for the way I play.
doesn't treat the, the guitar with like too much respect. Just using a lot of emotion and verging on violence. And it's something that he can um, be expressive with. Yeah, I've, I mean, that, that's technique that I've seen. But, you know, but I've learned enough to, to free me uh, from the constraints of having to learn to play something, you know. But I think it's very important to get to that stage, where you, because then, only then, you can really, uh, you, can, you know, express yourself in... I mean, it, not just play by numbers, you can actually be angry, or you can be sweet and lovely, whatever, and you can, you can do all that on the guitar. I was expecting kind of trad folk music, and the sound I heard was instantly blues and um, kind of jazzy progressions with this total one-man band approach. I mean, it just sounded like a one-man band to me. There are people, yeah, and you know, Bert's one of them, where it is actually an extension of, of in here, you know. It's not like this, um, this reverential thing towards the guitar, which a lot of musicians have. And um, it's funky, I think. I think the reason why Rosemary Lane is such a special record is to do with the time and place of its recording. Over about six months in 1970-71, really at the height of his international touring uh, schedule with the Pentangle, and yet in the midst of all that chaos, uh, all the you know the heavy schedules and the uh, big concerts and the, the, the heavy drinking that was going on in that period, he produces an album which is quite breathtakingly tranquil, um, purely guitar and vocal, uh, really a very serene, almost timeless quality to it. Kids, teenagers, are always going to seek out good music from whatever period. I'm just a guitar player, which I le all the stuff I learned, I learned from other people, you know. And, it's, uh, and that's all it is, is a, it's a, an amalgam of all those things. And then you see something like Bert and you, you, see, you see all this slapping going on all these things. You know, when I was watching him here today, you know, I've seen all these weird things going on. I was thinking, you're making it up as you go along, aren't you? Grand the moon Yale yale bar Blue black sky Tell me why Standing on the edge, she wants to learn to swim. She looks at the water, but she won't dive in. Stuff that's genuinely soulful in whatever idiom it's in kind of shoots through the generations like an arrow, really. And there's always something brilliant about somebody who's, who's got a really minimal attitude to music, or any art form, to come along and, and say, this piece of white paper. She's like a new spring flower Come out to play In the garden of Eve She brightens up the day But does she know it's coming?